Hello and welcome to Scream Theory. So this video isn't going to be a fry screaming tutorial, just more so it's going to be me nerding out and talking about the biomechanics and the muscle activity of the laryngeal muscles when performing fry screams. But this might serve to deepen your understanding and help you visualize what is going on mechanically in the larynx when performing fry screams. Now, when it comes to research regarding the voice, fry screaming has not very well been studied or even been studied at all. There are no studies or research that kind of delves deeper into the biomechanics of fry screaming. More so, in order to determine the muscle activity of the laryngeal muscles during a fry scream, this would be a very difficult thing to do, because this would require what is called an EMG, or electromyography. Electromyography is a technique that measures the electrical signals given off when a muscle contracts. So they take a very tiny needle and they stick it into a muscle belly and they have somebody perform an activity. And during that activity, they can determine at which points are certain muscles more involved than others. And in order to perform an EMG study on the larynx, a person would have to volunteer to have their laryngeal muscles poked with very tiny needles, and there would be a lot of risk associated with the procedure. So, unfortunately, there isn't really any substantial evidence to validate anything I'm about to say. This is more so my theory of the muscle activity that occurs during fry screaming. But it does make a lot of sense, and it does have a lot of face value. And I think by the end of this video, you're probably going to agree with me. But first, we need to understand how muscles contract. Muscles can perform three different types of contractions. There is concentric, isometric, and eccentric contractions. So I'm going to use my biceps muscles to demonstrate these contractions. The biceps bend the elbow. Now... A concentric contraction is when a muscle is shortening while under load. So here we have a 10 pound weight, and that is the load. And as my biceps contract and bend my elbow, they are shortening. An isometric contraction is when a muscle is under load, but it does not change length. So here I am just holding up this 10 pound weight, and my bicep is contracting to counteract the force of this weight. But my bicep is not shortening, and it is not lengthening. My elbow is not bending or straightening. And an eccentric contraction is when a muscle is lengthening while under load. So here I am very slowly lowering this 10-pound weight as I straighten my elbow, and my bicep muscle is contracting, but it is lengthening. So those are the three different types of muscle contractions, but there's one more concept I want to show you. I want you to flex your arm muscles like you just got done working out and you go up to a mirror and you want to make your arm muscles look all big so you squeeze them and you can feel that your biceps are indeed contracting. You feel that they are more firm, they are more rigid, there is more muscle tone in the biceps. But how can it be that the biceps are contracting without shortening? Well that is because if you feel over on your triceps, they're contracting too. The biceps bend the elbow and the triceps straighten the elbow. So these muscles do the opposite actions of each other, and this is called an agonist-antagonist relationship. So on one hand, the biceps are contracting to bend the elbow, but the triceps are contracting to straighten the elbow. These muscles are producing equal and opposite forces of each other. And the end result is both muscles are contracting, but without a change in length of either muscle, because they are resisting each other. The agonist muscle and the antagonist muscle are producing equal and opposite forces. So both muscles become more firm and rigid, but neither of them shortens nor lengthens. Now, when muscles contract, there is an increase in muscle tone. And this is not musical tone. Muscle tone is the rigidity or the stiffness of a muscle while it is contracting. So that's just very basic information on how muscles contract, and that's really all you need to know to understand what I want to show you with fry screaming. But now let's put this in the context of the laryngeal muscles. All right, so this is a front-facing view of the larynx in the frontal plane, and here we can see the thyroid cartilage, which is essentially just the Adam's apple. You can see the cricoid cartilage, which is a cartilaginous ring that sits at the top of the trachea or at the bottom of the larynx. You can see the epiglottis, which closes over the top of the larynx whenever we swallow to prevent food and liquids from entering our lungs. 
and you can see the left and the right cricothyroid muscles, which are located anteriorly and laterally on the larynx. They attach from the cricoid cartilage to the thyroid cartilage, hence the name cricothyroid muscles. So now this is a sideways or a sagittal view of the larynx so that we can see the action of the cricothyroid muscles. When these muscles contract, they lengthen the vocal cords and they do this by tipping the thyroid cartilage slightly forward and downward. And this action puts the vocal cords on a little bit of a stretch. So now this is a view of the back of the larynx where the back of the larynx is closer to the screen and the front of the larynx is deeper into the screen. I have removed the thyroid cartilage because it was getting in the way a little bit, but you can see the vocal cords would attach from the arytenoid cartilage in the back of the larynx to the thyroid cartilage, which would be in the front. So now here we can see the muscles that shorten or slacken the vocal cords, such as the thyroarytenoid muscles, which run from the thyroid cartilage to the arytenoid cartilage, and when they contract, they shorten the vocal cords. And we can see the vocalis muscles, which also contract to shorten the vocal cords, but these muscles are built into the vocal cords. They are part of the vocal cords themselves, and they run longitudinally through the vocal cords. And we can also see the vocalis, or the vocal ligaments, located medially on the vocal cords. So what I really want to focus on is the thyroarytenoid and vocalis muscles that shorten the vocal cords, but we also have the cricothyroid muscles that lengthen the vocal cords. So here we have muscles that do the opposite actions of each other, an agonist-antagonist relationship. So what I suspect is happening during a fry scream is that there is an isometric contraction of the cricothyroid and vocalis muscles. The vocalis muscles are contracting and attempting to shorten the vocal cords, but the cricothyroid muscle is producing an equal and opposite force to prevent that shortening. And the result is the vocal cords are not changing length but there is an increase in the muscle tone of the vocalis muscles. The vocalis muscles can get stiffer and more rigid the same way when you were contracting your bicep. So long story short, fry screaming is an isometric contraction of the cricothyroid muscle and the vocalis muscle. Now, most other anatomy texts also depict the thyroarytenoid muscle as being also built into the vocal cords, running longitudinally through it, just laterally to the vocalis muscle. So I think we can also assume that the thyroarytenoid muscle also plays a role in fry screaming by the same action that the vocalis muscle does, contracting and increasing the tension and muscle tone in the vocal cords. Now, this makes a lot of sense, and I think it also explains why fry screaming is such a difficult motor skill to learn. Because when we sing and we raise the pitch of our voice, we are lengthening the vocal cords and there is greater muscle activity of the cricothyroid muscles. But when we lower the pitch of our voice, the vocal cords shorten and there is greater activity of the thyroarytenoid and vocalis muscles. But with fry screaming, we are not only trying to make these muscles contract at the same time, we are trying to make them contract with just enough force to increase the muscle tone in the vocal cords to just the right amount so that the fry screaming mechanism works. And that is why fry screaming feels like such a foreign task when beginners try to learn it, because we're trying to use these laryngeal muscles differently than we normally use them. And it requires such a fine degree of motor control over these muscles. And furthermore, when we sing a clean note and transition into a fry scream, as the quality of the sound changes from the clean note to more of a distorted tone, not only does it sound like it, but you can also feel the increased tension in the thyroarytenoid and vocalis muscles being counterbalanced by the contractions of the cricothyroid muscles.
So that's pretty much it. Now, there's probably other laryngeal muscles that are involved in fry screaming to some degree, but when it comes to the mechanism behind how the distortion is produced, how the vocal cords can actually change the quality of their sound to produce this distortion, I think this theory is like the best explanation. Because we really don't have much control over the quality of the tones that the vocal cords produce, other than lengthening and shortening them to change the pitch. Everything else that happens when we shape those tones into words and embellish those tones happens above the larynx. We can use our upper airway, our oropharynx, our mouth, our lips, our tongue to further shape those tones, but the vocal cords can really only produce a constant buzzing tone, whether that's at a low pitch or a medium pitch or a high pitch, depending on how far they're stretched or shortened. But with fry screaming, we actually are changing the quality of the tones that the vocal cords produce. We are altering the way the vocal cords vibrate to produce distortion in our voice. So I think it makes the most sense that by tensioning the vocal cords without causing a change in length is what alters the way the vocal cords vibrate to produce the distortion in fry screaming. Muscles become more rigid when we contract them, and finding the right amount of rigidity or muscle tone in the vocalis and thyroerytenoid muscles is the key to fry screaming. If we contract these muscles too hard, then the vocal cords stop vibrating because they become too stiff to vibrate. But if we don't contract them enough and the vocal cords are too lax, then they vibrate like normal and produce our normal speaking or singing voice. So that's all I've got for you in this video, but if you found this interesting or you have other ideas about the biomechanics of fry screaming, then let me know in the comments. If you like the way I teach metal vocals, well please comment, subscribe to Scream Theory, and leave a thumbs up. I'll see you in the next one.